when you hear Juliet, you're supposed to think Romeo and of Juliet. Not yeah. Rocco? And the nurse is in Shakespeare's play, right. uh, the character with the largest number of lines after Romeo and Juliet, <coughs> wow. right? And she's got a fan, I see. Yes. Right? She's really great. She's a sort of body, yeah. tragic, high, low, puts herself in the middle of everything. And I thought she deserved to tell her own story. Mm -hmm. um, one of the tricks of writing this book is that we're all supposed to know Romeo and Juliet, except that if we actually had to take a pop quiz right now, you might be a little fuzzy on some Let's of the do details. It. I qualify. Yeah. So on the one hand, the story has to work for people who have like this vague idea that Juliet's with this guy Romeo and things don't work out that well and they don't remember anything else about the play, but also has to work for the people who are like Shakespeare fanatics and will know every single line. Um, the most famous scene in Romeo and Juliet is... Romeo, Romeo, Romeo. wherefore art thou... The balcony scene, right? Except that the nurse is not in that scene. So this is extremely challenging for me because I have to write the scene so that readers will know that they're seeing that thing that they know they're supposed to know, but she's not actually there for it. Um, so that's what I'm going to read you now. It's going to start actually when Romeo and Juliet first meet and go into the balcony scene. Here are the things that you would know... See how far in the book we are? You've missed a lot. So here are the things that are just little details I need to fill you in on. Um, the nurse is widowed. She had a husband named Pietro. They loved each other very much. Uh, the names that you would know from Shakespeare are Capulet and Montague, but the story is set in Verona, Italy, and those aren't the real Italian names. So here they will be the Capuletti and the Montecchi. They hate each other. Juliet is on the Capuletti side. So is her cousin Tybalt, who is... Uh, sort of mad, bad, and out of control around the sword fighting stuff, so you'll see him. Um, you will hear about Paris. So Juliet is supposed to marry, her parents want her to marry Paris, who is part of the royal family. Uh, so you'll get to see a little bit of Paris here, and his cousin, also part of the royal family, Mercutio, who's kind of like the party boy of Verona. Um, this is a big party at the Capulet's house, so or Capuletti's house, they're all partying down. The nurse, she loves Juliet, and she thinks she loves Juliet more than anybody else. So she is the servant to Juliet's family, and she's a little bit resentful of Juliet's parents. I think that's all you need to know. Ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I would like to say the word forsooth is never once used in this book. <laughs> in case you were wondering. <laughs> I'm flushed with wine, but Lady Capulet is flushed with something else, the Samite gown pulling low upon her bosom as she leans close to Paris. Nurse, I crave. Paris arches an eyebrow at the word, which makes her flush more. A word. I crave a word with Juliet. Fetch her here. Fetch. Like I'm a hound and Juliet some slobbered upon bone. <laughs> but I nod and curtsy and seek Juliet, who I find not among the dancers, but after seeking everywhere, Discover in an alcove speaking to one of the masked guests, a thin and tallish fellow. Pilgrim, I hear, and prayer, and book. Can my Juliet be so simple-hearted, wasting an evening's revels in such dull talk? I speak boldly, for surely she'll be glad to be called away from such as this. Your mother craves a word with you. Hearing me, and realizing she's been overheard, Juliet flitters like a pale moth and is gone. What is her mother? The fellow asks. What is her mother? I might count all heaven's stars before I could count the ways I can answer that. Marry, bachelor, I say. If he's a clever man, he'll know what I say next is as untrue as a married bachelor could be. Her mother is the lady of the house, and a good lady, and a wise and virtuous one. Though he's not as handsome above as Paris, nor so well-formed below as Mercutio. Uh, <laughs> Still he has a boyish pretty mouth below his mask and a pair of shapely arms. I press myself close upon those arms and say, I nursed her that you talked with all. I tell you, he that can lay hold of her shall have the chinks, chinks of the precious dowry coins Lord Capuletto will gift Paris for her treasured maidenhead. With that bit of bod, I go after Juliet. But the wine pounds in my head more steadily than my feet pound upon the floor. I'm whirled this way and that among the press of people until Lord Capuletto orders the musicians done and the stairway torch is lit. I find my darling standing to the side, watching the departing guests. She pulls me near, near to ask who this one is and that, just as she's done since she was a girl of six, wide-eyed at all the finery worn to a fet. When she points to the pretty-mouthed one, I tell her I know not his name. 
My knowing not is not enough, and off she sends me to find out. But this guest, I ask, does not know, and neither does that. And so I go on inquiring, until I feel a grope upon my rump, and turning quick, collide into Mercutio, mm -hmm. who laughs and tells me, the pretty mouth youth is called Romeo. The name means not to me. What Romeo, I ask? Mm. Romeo Montecchi. Such a rascal as this Mercutio to prank me with false words. I parry back, what man is mad enough to bring a Montecchi here? Mercutio roars open mouth and says he is the man, and if a saucy maid will call him mad, she'll get what she deserves. With that, he swats my bottom, sending me stumbling. When I write myself, I keep on my way until I'm back beside Juliet. His name is Romeo, and I'm Montecchi. All Lord Capuletto's railing about the ill blood between their families ought to make the name familiar to her. But her startled eyes fill with such confusion, I add, son of your great enemy. I take care to whisper, for if Tybalt hears a Montecchi here, there's, if Tybalt hears a Montecchi's here, and him already in such angry spirits. But when I look about for Tybalt, he's nowhere in the room. How long is it since I had sight of him? If he sees this Romeo passing from his uncle's house, Tybalt will follow him into some dark corner of the city to lay sword to him. Or not to him, but them. For Romeo leaves with Mercutio and half a dozen of the other maskers. Tybalt is hot enough to try them all. Which worries me so much, I only half hear Juliet reciting some verses, twining hate and late and love and enmity. I cup a hand to my ear. What's this? What's this? Even in this near extinguished light, I feel the warmth of her blush as she answers. A rhyme I learned of one I danced with all. A pretty bit poesy from Paris, it must be. I'm impatient to have her tell it to me, that I might know what count to take of him. But before I bid her, I can bid her to repeat it, Lord Capuletto calls for Juliet. Anon, anon, I answer, for I'll not make her face him alone. We find him misty-eyed and musty breath, speaking of fathers and daughters, and the honor it will be to unite his house with Paris's royal one. Hearing him, Juliet goes green as a spinached egg. Huh. Only my quick catch keeps her from falling to the floor. It's late, I say, and the torches make for close air on such a hot night. With no more by your leave than that, I steer my girl away to our bedchamber. What have you had to drink, I ask, when we're shut up alone? Not but water, she says. Not to drink. No wonder she is weak. I hide in the kitchen, snatch the most delicate remaining morsels, and tuck a vessel near full of wine beneath my arm. Laden, I return to find the chamber door pulled fast to me. I call once, twice, and a third time, worrying that she's fainted. But, ear to the door, I'd swear I hear her speak, answered by a second voice sounding farther off. Tybalt, perhaps, climbed up to her window as he did so many times in childhood. Could he have found a heart for such frolicking tonight? If any could call him to it, it would be Juliet. Her bounty is as boundless as the sea, her love is deep, Paris's wooing must be catching for my thoughts to weave into such lover's verse. Juliet, I call once more. The door flies open. Juliet's no longer the pale moth, nor the Florentine's greened egg. She's pinked and pleased and pulls me inside and shuts the door behind me. Steals a look toward the window and asks, Nurse, what hour is it? The answer throbs from my sore head to my swelled feet. It's so late of night, it's better called early on the morrow, I say. She fills a silver goblet with rubied wine and passes it to me. Will it be long till the hour of nine? I mark the pearly tooth she works into her lip. Perhaps it was another man's voice I heard without, a more smitten heart than Tybalt's calling, as she stood in the window as shining fair as the east's own sun. The laws are already rung, I tell her. Next will be the prime bells, bells and after that the churches, and that ring the hour of nine. Are you so well wooed and your heart so fully won that you forget such simple things? The question makes her laugh and cry and throw her arms around me. So furiously am I hugged, the goblet drops, splashing wine across us both. My Morello hides it well enough, but the beautiful Zaitani she wears is ruined. I tut at her. Love struck though he is, if he saw you now. I only mean to tease, but Juliet digs sharp nails into me. What do you mean? Will he not be true when he sees me for what I am? I rock her in my arms like I did when she was but a babe. Mm. Have no worries, I say. If it's already early on the morrow, then by my saints, this will be the day that you are trothed to Paris. Paris? 
name falls like a curse from her mouth. Juliet, did he not please you? If you care for him, be plain about it. Elsewise, you are unfair to Paris. Would that I were unfair to Paris, she says. What do I care if he finds me fair? I catch her chin in my hand, look close into her eyes. It's not a flirt's pretty pout that pulls at her features. So you do not love, I ask? Love? Of course I love. She lays her head upon my neck. But this love I have is not for Paris. Then for who, I ask? She lifts her head and turns half away. What is who? Who am I or you or any of us when love makes changelings of us? What if I were not a Capoletta? What if I were a Montecchi? Her words are like a needle drawn too hard. They bunch my brow. They make no sense to me. But you were not born to the house of Montecchi, I say. Some strange sentiment tremors across her. Not born, she says, but what if I were wed to it? Is there a heart that knows a heart better than I know this child? <laughs> For I see now what was right before my nose some hours past. Romeo, the one you spoke with all, is he this love? Romeo. She <laughs> sighs to say his name. No rose could be more sweet, no man more meet. Tears shine in her eyes, and something more shines upon her lips. I do love, and Romeo is the one I love, and Romeo loves me. The hard stone floor seems to shift, the very earth sliding from beneath me. Paris, such a match would he be for my girl. I could not conjure more kind, more handsome, more well-placed than he. But how could I wish for her the match Lord Capoletto makes, if it had been no more loving a marriage than his own? Would I have her so miserable with wealth and rank as Lady Capoletta, when I know how even on our hungriest days love fed me and my husband Pietro? and all of our sons. This is the lesson the rich never learn. A full heart lasts longer than a full belly, and a well-carved bed hung with finely painted canopy and curtains is no great fortune to the wife who finds no pleasure there. Mm. Ooh, if Romeo loves you as Pietro loved me, I tell her, you and he will win my consent. But first I must know if his heart is as true as yours. At nine you shall know, she says, I told him I would send to him at that hour. She's so love-struck, she kisses my lids and lobes and the great wine-soaked Morello-covered bosom of me as she says, your eyes must be mine and your ears and your heart as well, so you can judge by the light of day the truth of what I feel tonight. Judge I will, for Juliet is all to me. If I might see her married, not merely once, as I said before Lady Capoletta hours past, but well, as she begs of me now, then truly my heart will beam fuller than the moon and sun and all the fairest stars upon the heavens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Woo!